Hey guys, Mike here with Magnanimous, and we're back with another build of the day. Uh, if you didn't tune in yesterday, this is a new series that we're doing every day, Monday through Friday, where we'll be live streaming every afternoon, uh, taking a look at a build and kind of breaking it down, talking about all its bits and pieces, how it all works together, and then building it up together and just giving some feedback as we go. Uh, today is a build that I'm really excited about, and we are going to be live watching the chat. So if you guys have questions or anything, uh, you know, feel free, ask along on whatever uh, viewing platform you're on. We are going live to Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So if you guys are watching on any of those platforms, feel free to chat along the way, and we will address your questions at the end. Uh, do want to mention we are going live from Studio One. So this is a space that we rent here that uh, is an all sound treated studio, so it works really well for the small little live stream like we're doing now. Without further ado, let's get into the build though. And today we're going to be doing a build that uh, if you've watched some of our other videos, you definitely have heard me mention it before, but it's my favorite budget friendly build to do. Because uh, most of what we're looking at here is accomplished for about under $200 a day. Uh, if you had watched the video we did with our friends over at Indie Mogul, it was a big part of that video that we did, and that is the low budget music video setup. The core of that build is going to be our camera here, which is the Panasonic GH5. The GH5 is an awesome little budget friendly camera that packs a punch because it's going to be capable of 4K, 60 frames a second can also go up to 180 frames a second when you're shooting uh, 1080, if you're running to do a bunch of high speed stuff. And it also can capture 10-bit uh, color space. Color space is one that you'll hear thrown around a lot, 8-bit 420, 422, quad 4, a lot of different stuff there. Uh, this is going to be a 10-bit 422 encoding. And what that refers to is the amount of color information that is going to be captured in the recording. Uh, I like to always attribute it to the difference between like a school bus yellow and a canary yellow and really being able to dial in the shading and the differences and the nuance of color. So today we're going to be taking advantage of that 10-bit recording and because we're doing a music video we are going to do a little bit of high speed uh, but I find a good balance is necessary for music videos so in this case we're going to do a 1080 60p recording. That's going to give us approximately a two times slow motion if we want to slow things down. Uh, it's actually like a 2.2, 2.3 times, uh, but for all intents and purposes, it's a two times slow motion. Uh, so we're going to record in that 60, but it gives our editor the option if we don't want to slow things down, it can play back normal speed. If we need to slow things down, we can because we have that 60p to pull from. And I find it helps with data rates a lot, especially because we just have one 64 gig card right now. And so if we're running 4K 60 or 180, it's going to eat up data space a lot. So the 60 is going to give us a good balance where we're still getting frames to pull from for slow motion, but we're not slamming our, us hard with data rates. The other thing it's going to help is with low light performance because the GH5 is a little better than GH4, but still struggles for anything past 3200 ISO. Uh, you're just going to get too much noise for it to be usable. So shooting at 60p uh, to carry that standard 180 degree shutter angle will be at uh, 1 1 20th of a second. Uh, and we're not going to have to go so high on our shutter to where we're not capturing a lot of ambient light. Uh, to pair with that, we're going to go with the Leica DG Vario 12 to 60 millimeter. This is a great native micro four thirds lens that'll pair well with the Panasonic GH5. And it features uh, optical stabilization and a fast 2.8 aperture while you're wide. Uh, one of the downsides anytime you're going to get into a wide zoom range in a small micro four thirds lens is a variable aperture. It's kind of unavoidable uh, unless you're going to pack a ton of glass into this small little lens. So to keep it lightweight, uh, it does change its aperture as you go. So it goes to an f4 at the 60 range because you'll notice that our lens does telescope out quite a bit. 
Uh, it's really not going to hinder our purposes today because we're actually going to put this on a gimbal setup. And so for that, we're actually going to park our lens at the widest focal length, and we're not going to zoom. And so we're just going to utilize that nice, fast 2.8 aperture, which will also help us with that low light performance. It's going to find a good balance there. Then, as we said, we're going to go ahead and pair that with the Ronin S gimbal here. Now, I purposely started with this broken down so you guys could see me build it up for those of you who haven't worked with this system before. Uh, but one of the big points you'll notice is the small little focus wheel right here on the side. And that's kind of a critical part of the build that we're doing today because we're going to route our focus control through the Ronin S into our GH5 to the 12 to 60 so that we can pull that focus from this focus wheel right here. And that's really capable uh, because we're using a native Lumix lens that's going to communicate well through that micro four thirds mount to create just kind of a all-in-one camera ecosystem that's going to keep everything really compact and simple to work with. Setting it up, it'll be a breeze, and we'll go over that uh, after we get everything all built up. Then to pair with that, we're going to go back to another Teradex system. This is a really awesome piece that we just got in. You guys may have seen me talking about it on Instagram before. This is the Teradek Bolt Ace Director Bundle. And that is a two-part system here, which is a small lightweight transmitter that takes a HDMI input and can be powered off of this small bracket right here, off of lightweight batteries, either LPE6 or Sony uh, NP-style batteries and transmits up to 500 feet away to this lightweight handheld monitor here. You'll notice the antennas in the top, and that's because the Teradek transmitter is actually built directly into this monitor. And so we don't need to mount extra bits or pieces or anything. We're just going to use this piece right here. It's going to receive everything there. Uh, to open up our space a little bit, and so you guys can try and keep an eye over there, I hope you can see all right. We're going to throw this baby adapter underneath so that I can pop it onto this stand to the left of me over here. So I'm going to go ahead and just set him right there. It's always useful to have, you know, I like to give directors the option so if they get tired of carrying it around, they don't have to. Popping it on a wheeled stand like this is real easy so that you can keep it portable and, you know, their hands can be free to do other things. Uh, but then you can easily just pop it off, run around with it if you need to. Do keep in mind the Teradex systems uh, require line of sight, so you're not going to be able to run this through a doorway or something like that. Um, it's not going to go through walls. You're going to need to stay within sight of each other, but you can get up to 500 feet away, so it does give you some freedom in that sense. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for overview of all of our bits and pieces. So uh, let's talk why we're doing all of this. Um, mostly just because the Ronin S pairs so well with the GH5. Uh, it has a lot of really cool features we'll talk about after we build everything up. But we're going to talk about uh, smooth lock operation and what that means, how to balance the system, and then uh, infinite roll, which is a really requested one specifically for music videos. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and start building this guy up. Uh, to start, why don't we go ahead and get the Ronin S put together. For those of you who may have worked with gimbal systems in the past, this probably is going to be a bit of a refresher. Uh, but for those of you who haven't, I'm going to go real slow and kind of walk through my process for balancing these and why I do everything. Um, like I mentioned before, if you guys have questions at all during this whole process, comment below and we'll have a section at the end where we'll address all of those. And so I can go back and kind of talk about why I did a particular thing or how to approach it differently if you uh, are having trouble with it in one of your builds or something like that. So uh, the Ronin S is awesome because it has this little tri-stand here. I went ahead and attached it without talking about it, but uh, yeah, it gives you the small stand right here that everything's going to build out on instead of a traditional gimbal system that would have a secondary stand that you have to mount to. Uh, it keeps things smaller, lighter weight. You know, if you're a single person and don't have a bunch of extra hands, all of this could fit in one backpack, and you won't need all these extra pieces to make it work. It can all just fit right here. 
we'll go ahead and attach our gimbal assembly, which is done with a small silver release right here. So we're just going to slide that back and go ahead and pop him on and tighten him down. Now, for those of you who haven't worked with gimbal systems before, a gimbal system is referred to as a three-axis motorized stabilizer. And what that means is there's a series of three motors at each of your three major axes, a pan here at the bottom, a roll in the back here, and a tilt on the side right here. And those motors are going to work in tune with each other to stabilize our camera in the center here. And I'm going to be able to tell the system to move either with a joystick in the back or with my movement with the gimbal, and it'll respond and move my camera accordingly. And so, in order for it to do that, we're going to have to do what's called balance. And that's done because these motors are optimized for a particular payload, and that payload needs to be as centralized in its balance as possible, so that the motors have to work as little as they can. We won't power this system on at all until we finish the entire build and our entire balancing process. That way, we know that it's all good to go and our motors aren't going to get stressed. If you fail to balance properly, it can result in poor performance by the gimbal because it's going to be you know, shaky or it may be drifting in a particular axis, uh, or it can potentially damage the unit, which of course we don't want because we want to keep our Ronin S here nice and healthy so it's good uh, for everyone who needs to rent it. So let's go ahead and get our camera set up and we'll attach it up to our gimbal and start our balancing process. I'm just going to set this guy to the side here. To start your camera and getting it ready, uh, there's a couple things that you want to do first. And it's what I call getting your camera shoot ready. And what I mean by shoot ready is you have a uh, battery in your camera, you have a card in your camera, and your lens is attached with its lens cap off. Uh, because any little bit of weight on this system is going to affect the balance. You may not think an individual SD card means a whole lot in terms of the weight of the system, but a few ounces goes a long way to skew our balance, and even just a lens cap on the end could cause an issue with our balance. So we're going to go ahead and attach our lens here. And we'll go ahead and remove our lens cap. Now, we are shooting in the studio today, and uh, we have some bright sources to keep me lit for you guys. So I am going to go ahead and run our lens hood to help control flare coming in from those, because I don't want to excess light hitting my lens, uh, which is m easy to do. You just have to make sure that you prepare properly and balance with that hood on the front, because it's going to add weight to the distribution of everything. Uh, now we have to attach our plate to this. And it requires an important step where we define the center of balance for our camera. Because we're going to need to put our camera on the mounting plate, but if we don't mount our camera properly and we have you know, too much of the mounting plate sticking off in the back, I'm going to need to adjust my camera's position. I may not be able to push it back far enough. So we want to find that center point. Anytime I'm talking about balancing the axes, you know, think of each axis as a teeter-totter, right? So if I have my teeter-totter here, as I add weight to one side, it's going to cause it to tip. And as I add weight to the other side, it's going to cause it to tip in the other direction. So what we're looking for is a nice centralized balance where nothing's moving at all. You know, in an ideal world where this gimbal existed in a vacuum and there was no air or anything like that, a perfect balance could be put in any position and our camera wouldn't move at all. We don't live in a perfect world, we're not in a vacuum, but we're going to strive to get as close to that as we can so we get the best performance out of our gimbal. To do that, we're going to need to find the uh, central point of our weight for our system here. For DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, you can almost always just assume your center of balance is going to be right below your lens mount here, which is right where the lens connects to the camera. And I've found that just across almost every pairing of lens and body that I've done, that that's where it lands for those cameras. Um, if you have a heavier lens, it may shift it a little bit. But really, we're looking for half of our mounting plate to be split on either side of that central. Uh, the GH5 is unique in that it's a very short camera. 
So as a result, we are going to need to use this small riser block. It's about a quarter to a half an inch tall, and it's just going to lift our camera up a little bit to allow us to get a proper balance. So we're going to start by going ahead and attaching that guy, which is just taking one mounting screw and running it through the channel here. And we'll go ahead and mount our camera to that. I like to put my riser block as far forward as I can on the camera just to make sure that I can maintain that center balance with it. And we'll go ahead and tighten that guy down. And then I always like to double check that nothing is turning on me because the last thing we want to do is get all of this balanced and have something shift. Once we have our riser block attached, we can attach our mounting plate to the riser block. And that uses our last two quarter 20 mounting screws. I'm just going to go ahead and pop these guys in here. And we can go ahead and attach that guy on. There is a small arrow that you'll see that will indicate the front. And so we'll go ahead and align that up accordingly. Now what I like to do is just lightly attach my mounting screws so that my plate can still slide. That way I can find what's going to be the best position. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and just do all the way forward. It's going to be the best place for us. And we can go ahead and tighten this guy down. Same thing, we're going to check just to make sure nothing's shifting on us. Everything's nice and secure. And there we go. Now we do have one other decision to make here. Uh, because I don't have an onboard monitor, so we can either fold our monitor out and try and view off of that, or we can flip it and have it shut like that. I'm going to go ahead and run with it out because I like that setup a little better. Uh, but we are going to need to make sure that we balance everything with it shifted to the side. Uh, there are a couple camera settings I am going to go ahead and set up right now, just so I don't have to do it once we get it on the gimbal. So we'll pop our camera on. The first thing I want to do is set up our camera to what's called PC tether mode. And that's going to allow this cable here to go from the USB-C plug of the GH5 into a proprietary 8-pin uh, port on the side of the Ronin-S to communicate the lens information so we can use that follow focus. Unfortunately, I don't have a way for you guys to see my camera menu here, so I'll go ahead and describe the camera menu path for you. Just go ahead and uh, hit Menu. Oh, don't start recording on accident. There we go. So we'll go Menu, and then you'll look for the wrench icon. At the wrench icon, you'll go to USB Mode, and we're going to change that to PC parentheses tether. Once we're done with that, the next thing I want to do is uh, set up manual focus. By default, the GH5 has a setting that I hate, which is manual focus assist. So as I try and pull focus, it zooms in for me because it thinks I need help finding that, uh, which I find extremely distracting. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that off, which is in uh, lens and other and we'll go find uh, Manual Focus Assist and just turn it off. It's uh, on page three. And then the other setting we're going to go to is under Monitor Display. So you'll go to the wrench icon with the C on it, go to Monitor Display, and then uh, you're looking for Peaking. So I'm turning Peaking on so that I'm able to see my in-focus areas highlighted in a color so that I know where my focus is falling. It's going to make pulling ma manual focus on the go uh, just much easier for me. Uh, and it's a setting I like to use a lot for on-the-move stuff. I recommend setting your peaking color to be something that will uh, contrast with the shooting environment that you're in. Uh, Typically, I do a hard red, but it's really up to whatever you're doing. In this case, I'm going to find peaking on page 5, and I'm going to set it to on, and then I'm going to go down to set. Uh, out of the colors we have here, I'm going to go ahead and do 
green because we have a lot of pink behind us and I think the green will contrast well for me. And then I'm going to go ahead and set our detect level to high. Uh, you have two options, low or high. If you're in an extremely uh, dark environment with a lot of noise, it might be easier to shift to low. Uh, but for our purposes here, I'll go ahead and keep it at high. Then uh, I will set our exposure mode uh, to manual so that we can adjust that. And then we'll set our recording mode. I like to do MP4 LPCM. It gives you access to the higher bit rate uh, recordings. And we'll go ahead and go to Full HD 10-bit All I 60P. And that'll give us that nice recording that's very flexible like we talked about before. And then I will go ahead and get my uh, shutter speed set. Because we're going to want to go to that 1 1 20th shutter speed that we talked about. Go ahead and open up. Great. I guess in this case, we don't have a 1 1 so it's going to be 1 but close enough. Uh, it's going to be negligible in terms of how it's affecting. Um, cool. Once we've gotten that, we're kind of all set on this end. Uh, we could go ahead and attach all of our bits and pieces to this right now. I don't like to do that, though, because I've found that it can make mounting to the gimbal assembly itself challenging, especially if you have a bunch of cables hanging off, things like that. So I prefer to mount camera, do a very basic bill or balance, then we'll start adding stuff to it, and we'll fine-tune our balance as we go. So. Let's go ahead and start with that. Now, we're going to walk through what I refer to as the most non-destructive balancing process. And what I mean by that is you have to redo your work the least. I'm always the guy looking to streamline the process. You know, what can I, how can I do it in the fewest amount of steps and the fastest way possible? So I don't want to have to go back and readjust a motor you know, two or three different times if I've already adjusted it and think it's good. So I'm not going to start with my pan because the pan is immediately affected by every other axis. So we're actually going to do that last. We're going to start with our front to back balance here. And then we'll go to our vertical balance. Then we'll do our roll. And then we'll do our pan. And with that, we'll work in the fastest way possible and we'll redo our work the least. So I'm going to go ahead and attach our camera to here. You're going to hear, oh, well, it looks like our platform is a little bit too far in, so we're going to have to move that over. There's just a small adjustment knob right here. I'm just going to slide him out. All right, you'll hear that snap as it mounts in. That's a safety lock, so it's going to prevent our camera from going too far in either direction, which is great so that as we're working with our camera, we don't accidentally let go and our camera go flying off our gimbal system. Um, just something to, to help you out along the way. Now, uh, we're going to isolate each of these axes and work one at a time. So you'll notice just right out the gate, it's pulling really heavy to the right. We could go ahead and adjust that if we needed to. But for my purposes, I'm just going to put my hand here and I'm just going to hold it in place here. And we're going to start with our front to back. So what I'm looking for, and I'll turn this so you guys can see, is I'm watching which direction my camera is going to tilt. Right? So we have our teeter-totter, and I'm identifying where the weight is at so that I can centralize it. So if I let go here, you'll notice we're tilting back a little bit. So I'm going to slide my camera forward, and I'm going to do that until I notice that my camera is beginning to tip forward. That does what I call define a range, right? So we now know the furthest point we need to go on one side and the furthest point we need to go on the other. And all we need to do is work within that range to slowly refine those values until we find that nice middle ground. So I'll go ahead and do that real quick for you guys. It's really about muscle memory at this point. You know, the more you do it, the more practice you're going to have. Because I found, especially on difficult builds, I just close my eyes and go by feel more than the side of it all. There are some markings you'll see. I hope you guys can make them out on the sides of the plate on each side. 
that you can use to help uh, act as a guide as you're working. Um, but really, I've found that just going by eyesight and uh, feel is the, the best way to do it. So you'll notice that my camera's sitting all right there. It's doing a little bit of a pendulum swing, and that's just because we're so far down. Uh, we're going to need to adjust our vertical balance, and then we can come back and refine this a little better. To do our vertical, I'm going to go ahead and flip my camera horizontal like this. So now I've isolated that vertical balance. And same thing, we're just going to work through our teeter-totter. In this sense, you'll notice my camera is very bottom heavy. So it's going to drop almost immediately. So I'm going to loosen this thumb knob here. And I'm just going to slide my camera up. A little advice here, I found that the channel that this armature sits in can shift up and down a little bit. And so if all the weight's pulling it down, it can be hard to slide forward and back. So what I like to do is just do a slight lift up. I hope you can make that out if we can zoom in on it. You can see I just lift up slightly there, and that's going to help it slide much easier to make just my life balancing uh, much easier. The GH5 here is short enough that we're going to have to slide it pretty far up to get our balance. So I'm just going to go ahead and go all the way up. And you'll see we, we now know, OK, it's a little too far. We're falling up there. And I'm just going to back him up just a little bit to what feels about right. Maybe it's still a little bottom heavy, but that right there is what we're looking for. I don't even have the thumb screw secured. It's just staying in place right there because the balance is really good. So I'm going to go ahead and lock this guy down. If we turn back down, though, you'll notice it's a little back heavy on my front to back. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust that right now. And there we go. And so you can see now that my camera not only stays in position there, but as I tilt up, it stays in position there. And that's really what we're looking for so we know our tilt motor is all balanced properly. So now let's move to our roll. Our roll is what's going to adjust our left to right. There's technically two ways to do it. You can adjust under the camera here and slide it left to right. But I found that it's very limited in what you can do. So I prefer to do all my main adjustment from my roll arm back here. Same thing goes with this. I'm going to loosen, but I'm actually going to lift up slightly as I slide to ensure that I get a nice, easy adjustment there. And we're just going to look and see you know, where is he fallen, at what point does it fall the other direction, and refine our distance there. And we're looking for something that's going to stay nice and even. We're tilting a little bit to the side. I get real picky with my balances, so I'm going to just adjust a little bit more to refine that to make it as good as it can be. Um, one of the things we're going to do at this point, uh, that's why I have my tape sitting here, is uh, you'll notice, if we look, we have a pretty good balance right now. But as I zoom my lens, it's going to telescope out, right? And my weight's changed, which causes my balance to change. Uh, we can adjust as we're shooting if we need to. We can turn the system off, change our focal length, and then rebalance if we need to. But I'm really not interested in that. I want to utilize our nice wide open 2.8. So what I'm going to do is just tear off a small piece of tape here. And I'm going to tape my uh, zoom ring so that it doesn't move. That's going to lock it in place. And now, no matter how much I try and move it, it's going to stay at a 12 millimeter, which is going to lock us in place. Uh, you'll notice it's actually changed my balance just a little bit. Could be the weight of the tape. Could be that the hadn't been quite zoomed out wide enough. So we'll just refine that just a little bit here. And lastly, we're going to go ahead and do our pan motor. Now, this is the motor I most commonly see people uh, mess up, to be honest. Uh, people forget to balance it, or they balance it in the wrong way, or they just don't quite get it good enough. So this is my method that I found to be the best for balancing pan. I'm going to turn it so that the arm of my gimbal is parallel to my body, aka the same uh, direction as my shoulders. And that's going to refine or define my teeter-totter, right? So that I'm going to tilt forward, 
And as I tilt, I'm going to look for where my weight's distributed. If my weight is further in the front, it's going to fall forward like that. And I'll adjust it so you can see. If it's too far in the back, I'm going to go and it's going to fall backwards. And so we're going to do the same thing we've done with all the other axes. We're just going to tilt and I'm going to slowly slide until I can find a good spot. I've gotten pretty good at finding it pretty quickly, but uh, it may take you a little bit of time. But just do the same method for the others where we're going to refine those endpoints and just slowly shrink them in until we find that good balance there. And yeah, there we go. It's a little rough. It could use a little refinement here and there, but it's honestly good enough for us to start attaching stuff. And to start, we're going to go ahead and hook up our tether cable so that we have our focus control. That's going to plug into the USB-C side on our GH5 here. And it's going to run to this small port on the end of our bottom arm. There's a little plastic cover. So you can see I pull that down. You're going to have that 8-pin connection there. Another really important point when you're working with gimbal systems is cable management. Because if I just leave this cable hanging loose like that, it could catch on something as I'm operating. And if it catches, it's going to pull. That could damage either of the ports or damage the cable or just cut out in the middle of an important take or something like that. So I recommend uh, twist ties or tape to help secure cabling to ensure that it's not moving around or anything like that. So I'm just going to tear off another small little piece. And in this case, I'm going to wrap around this little screw here to use that as an anchor point. And I'm just going to tape my cable down in place. Like so. And that's going to help just keep things nice and clean. You'll notice we're already affecting our balance. Even just one small little cable is going to affect it. So that's the other reason we tie it down. If the cable's hanging loose and it's a longer cable, just the positioning of the cable as it moves can change your balance as well. Lastly, we're going to have to attach our Teradek transmitter so that we can get signal over here. Uh, for that, um, Let's actually go ahead and we'll go over pairing these guys. They should already be pre-paired if you guys are renting from us. But in case you have your own or something like that, we'll go ahead and talk about it a little bit. For that, let's go ahead and power this guy on uh, because we're going to need to pair them uh, with this little button right there. A common misconception that I've found is that people think this battery plate is uh, combative that it actually passes power through to the unit. It's not. It's just on a small mounting bracket so that they stay together. So you do need this small little power cable here, which is going to bridge the gap from our uh, plate into the Teradek transmitter. So we'll go ahead and plug that guy in and run him there. I'm going to use a twist tie to help secure our cable and keep everything together. I didn't plan my twist ties matching my tape, but I guess we have a blue theme on our camera build today. And from there, we're going to go ahead and attach our LPE6 battery, which will just pop in right there. You'll notice my lights come on showing that we're on. And then on our monitor here, we're just going to pop a battery in the back and our power switch is right on top. I've already paired these guys and I won't go through the pairing process again because uh, during our tests we realized that the radio signal of the transmitter can interfere with your lav kits. So be mindful on set when you're doing that. Um, but for the sake of pairing, we're going to come over to our input, make sure that we're set to wireless. And then we're going to go down to the wireless here and make sure wireless enable is selected. And then you'd go to pair here. We're already paired, so we would hit uh, use a paper clip. And you would hit the small little pairing icon there and hit pair here. Both would then find each other, and you'd be good to go. And you'll get a screen like this once they're paired. 
can swap over so you can see our monitor there. Now we got to attach this guy. For that, I have this small ball mount here, which is going to allow us to mount our transmitter. But I'm going to rotate my transmitter so that the ball mount is a 90 degree. That way, I can evenly distribute the weight directly over the lens, which is going to just give us a much easier uh, balancing. Because if this was directly up, we'd be a very tall setup that's going to be more challenging to balance. Here, I can mount directly to the top of our cold shoe. And now my weight is distributed over my lens. It'll be a little bit easier for us to balance. We are a little top heavy, so we're going to move a little bit here. But we're OK. We're going to take our HDMI cable here. And one of the other features I love of the GH5, it's a small feature, but oh man, it's so important, is a full-sized HDMI output. If you've worked with Sony mirrorlesses before, I hate micro HDMI if I can avoid it. Full HDMI is just so much better, and so the GH5 is awesome for that. Uh, we do have this excess cable here, but before we adjust that, I'm going to go ahead and balance our setup a little bit easier so we're not fighting the balance as we're going. We are very top heavy, so we're going to have to drop our system down. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here. Once again, guys, I've been doing this for you know six years plus, so I've gotten very quick at it. It's going to take you guys a little bit longer. Uh, I recommend budgeting at least an hour for your first balance of any gimbal system, uh, potentially longer, depending on how uh, how you're feeling about it, you know. If you're nervous, give yourself more time. Uh, last thing you want to do is try and pull this out and set it up right at uh, set with clients standing behind you being like, hey, are you ready to shoot? And you're like, no, I'm trying to figure out this gimbal system. Give yourself ample amount of time to work with it, get to know it. They are nuanced pieces of gear. Uh, with our vertical balance good, we can go to our front to uh, back. We're very front heavy, as you can see, because we've added a lot of weight in the front. So we'll go ahead and pull this guy back. There we are. And now I'm going to take an opportunity to, well, let's go ahead and just a roll here. There we go. Now we're going to go ahead and take the opportunity to uh, cable this HDMI cable a little bit better. Um, yay, we did. Plug and go. There you go. Already got signal up on the monitor. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and take that off for a second. And uh, in this case, I'm going to use the twist tie on the other cable. And I'm just going to tie these cables together. That way, they both stay a little bit cleaner. I haven't mentioned in a little bit, if there's anyone new that have jumped into the stream, uh, we're going to do a Q&A at the end. If you guys have uh, questions that come up or anything, just put them in the relevant chat below whatever platform you're viewing on, and we'll go over all of those at the end. But I'm just going to do a very simple coil here, and I'm going to tie these guys off together. And go ahead and run this guy down. We could run a port lock if we needed to, but in this case, uh, it's a very short run HDMI, and there's not really going to be much opportunity for it to snag on anything. So I'm not going to worry about a port lock uh, for this particular build. Last thing I'm going to do is just one more piece of tape just to hold these uh, in place so that they're not moving around on me. And I'm just going to tie those down uh, directly underneath here. All right, and uh, last thing we need to do is just a fine tune balance which is really just doing one more once over on all of our axes to make sure 
that nothing has shifted during our uh, prep and uh, setup on it all. So I'm just going to check here. Front to back looks good. Vertical looks good. Left to right looks good. We'll return to center. Check our pan. Pan's still a little off. Let's go ahead and pull that guy back. Really just changing a, you know, less than a millimeter at a time. But uh, yeah, that's good to me. So we can lock that guy down. And I would say at this point, we are ready to finally turn our gimbal system on. We have everything set up, ready to shoot up here. All our cables are ran. Everything's powered on. We've made sure all our signals are good. Um, can't stress enough how important it is to check those things before turning the system on. Uh, one, uh, one setup that we've done a few different times is running a RED into a Movi Pro. And uh, there's a way to route camera control, but there's a setting you have to set first, and it's turned off by default. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten that camera fully kitted out on the gimbal system, forgotten to change that setting, and I have to pull the whole thing down to reset it up because I have to pull things off to attach the monitor and just settings and all that. So do yourself a favor, make sure that all your signals are going through properly first so that you can troubleshoot, make changes, do those sorts of things before your gimbal system's on. And yeah, so we're ready to go ahead and turn it off, or turn it on. Our battery is turned off currently, so we'll need to wake that up because it's in sleep mode. So I'm just going to triple tap the button down here and you'll see four green lights turn on at the bottom. And then our power switch is just on the right side here. I'm just going to hold that down, and you're going to hear a ding as it turns on. It's going to adjust itself forward. Now, before we do anything, what we want to do is what's called auto-tune stability. And what that does is tell the uh, computer to test our motors and find the ideal stiffness settings for those motors with this particular balance. Uh, to do that, we're going to have to download a phone app. It's called the Ronin app. It should have a orange or an orange circle around the Ronin name. And we'll connect with our Bluetooth to this particular Ronin S. You'll see it immediately popped up there, uh, DGS Ronin 360039. We'll go ahead and connect to that guy. This will give us fine-tune adjustment over all of our gimbal parameters and settings, as well as a readout for battery life and uh, other things like that. Six-hour battery life on this, so you really aren't going to have to switch batteries a lot, but it's important to monitor because uh, if you're doing a long 10-hour shoot, you probably are going to have to shift batteries at some point. So in the app, we're going to go to Motor Parameters. And then right at the bottom is going to be a big blue auto-tune button. I'm going to go ahead and hit that. And it's going to pop up just making sure that you're ready to start the auto-tune because you don't want to accidentally auto-tune. And I'm going to hit OK. During this process, you'll notice it's stressing each of my motors. We don't want to touch anything. Leave it on a flat, stable surface so it can define those values. Uh, if you interrupt the auto-tune, it can cause a particular value to either be extremely high or extremely low, because what the computer is doing is going to start at a zero, basically, and stress it up until it hits the max. And then within that, it's going to find whatever the best setting was. So I found people accidentally interrupt in the middle of it and define like a really small value, like a three for stiffness or filter, which is going to cause it to really read our movement very strangely. Once our auto-tune is finished, we can look and see our stiffness values. And I then like to go over to Balance Test, which is back at your main page. What that's going to do is test our balance and tell us how good we did. Uh, we're going to hold the gimbal slightly at a slant, and we're going to hit Begin Test. And it's going to move the gimbal system around, and it's going to give us a rating on each axis so that we know uh, how good of a job we did. 
And we're looking for an excellent on every axis. All right, we ended up with a pan, roll, and tilt excellent across the board. So we know that we're good to go for shooting. Now from here, it's up to us to really define you know, what we want to do because you're going to have three main modes of operation. I'm going to actually stand up for this so I can demonstrate some of these to you guys. So let me scoot this out of the way. I'm going to move this guy forward so you guys can hopefully see our monitor there. Let me try and brighten up our exposure. Camera fell asleep. We're just going to wake him back up here. Oh, you know what I think is happening. Uh, we have a setting on where it's only outputting our image to our director monitor. We're not seeing anything here. Uh, that's an easy setting that we can adjust. I just didn't think about that when we were setting up first. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is just power off my gimbal system because I don't want my motors running while I make this adjustment. And I'm going to have to unplug my HDMI, so you guys are going to lose signal over there. And I'm going to go back to our monitor display settings, which is under the C wrench. All right, never mind. Uh, it is going to be under camera. So uh, in your menu, you'll have a camera icon with an M, which is for exposure settings. Or underneath that, you'll have just the camera icon. On page four, you'll see HDMI rec output. We're going to go ahead and set info display to off. That should fix our problem so that our HDMI maintains over here, and we still get signal there. So I've got image over here. And we've got image over there. Once again, guys, just another point to throw out there, importance of testing setups before you get to set, because we wouldn't want to have gotten to set and be freaking out trying to figure out why our setup wasn't working, uh, as once again, we have client behind us waiting to get started. So we should be ready to go ahead and boot everything back up. We haven't done any major changes to the payload within, so I don't feel it's necessary to auto-tune right now. If you guys are changing batteries, media, or anything that requires you to change the camera's position on the gimbal assembly, it is a good uh, force of habit to get into where you're auto-tuning between every setup or rebalance that you're doing or if you move location or something like that. Essentially, any time something within the gimbal assembly could have changed. So um, looking at this, I'll show you guys, you know, as I pick this up, it's going to follow my movements. So I can turn, and my camera's going to turn. And I'm basically leading my movement to tell the camera what I would like to do. I can tilt, and my camera will tilt and I can tilt up, and my camera will tilt up, and so on and so forth. And it's fairly responsive right now. I can fine tune those settings if I need to, to define that a little bit more. Uh, you'll also notice that my tripod stand, I folded down, it acts like a second hand grip, which I found can be really handy to get some very interesting movement with the gimbal, so that you can get some interesting free form movement like that. A few really quick tips that are very handy. If you double tap the trigger, which is located right here, 
it's going to auto recenter your camera. Super simple, super easy, so that if you're ever shooting and I get a little off center like this, and I'm like, ah, oh, how do I get back? Just double tap, it's going to go right back there for you. Super easy. You also have the joystick on the back here, so I can turn and my camera will turn and follow that movement. The joystick overrides my movement, so if I'm using the joystick and I'm moving, it's going to listen to the joystick. between those. One of the biggest decisions that you'll have to make in operating the gimbal is setting your smooth lock settings. So we have uh, our app here. We're going to go back to the Mm -hmm. Oh, they updated the app. I forgot where they moved it. To our user profile, where we can define each of our settings. All right, so once we're in our user profile, you'll have an option to adjust uh, pan, tilt, follow. Uh, I guess they did rename it. It used to be called Smooth Lock on your older Ronin systems. So if you reference like a Ronin M video, things like that, you'll see them referred there. In this case, we have a few different options uh, to adjust the follow. So a tilt follow, right, it will follow my movement as I tilt, camera tilts, so on and so forth. So we want to avoid that. We're going to go ahead and change to pan follow only. So with that now, I can pan and it'll pan with me, but as I tilt, it doesn't move. And that allows you to maintain a consistent horizon level, right? So what your camera sees as the horizon will stay consistent. And I really adjust between those two modes depending on what I'm shooting. For a more freeform B-roll movement type piece, I'm probably going to keep my tilt follow on so that it reads my movement. If I'm doing a critical tracking shot or really anything where I don't want camera to move all of a sudden, I'll keep it in the uh, tilt follow off and pan follow only. Another handy trick with the trigger here, you can hold the trigger down and it's going to negate all of your motors immediately and it's going to hold camera position. So if I'm doing a critical take, I can hold that down and now as I turn, as I tilt, as I roll, nothing changes and I can maintain all of that. There are three user modes that you can use and I will turn myself over here so you can see. The green light corresponds to which mode we're in and you can define each of those independently. So we're right now tilt follows turned off for one. If I go to two though, we'll see what user settings I have in two. I'm not sure what that one's set to. It actually seems like tilt follow is already turned off for that. So we could turn tilt follow on for one, switch to two when we want it off, and back very quickly. But what I'm also going to do is set up mode three to do something really, really cool, which is a commonly requested setup for music videos, which is this guy here. Uh, it's called 3D Roll 360. And so I'll try and get close so you guys can see. But I'm going to hit this icon here and just change it to 3D Roll 360 there. And you'll notice my camera is moved up, which seems a little strange. But that's because it's ready to operate in what's called uh, flashlight mode. So I'm going to tilt down, recenter there, so that I'm holding it with my arm here. I like to use the uh, handle down here to brace against my forearm because it's a lot of weight at the end of my arm there and it's going to strain your arm over time. You could clamp it to a stand or something like that if you needed to. And uh, finally, we're going to use our joystick here to do a 360 roll. You've seen shots like this in Inception, big 
budget music videos, things like that. But now you can accomplish them very easy with this budget solution here. I hope you guys can make out on the monitor there. Um, not sure how easy it's looking for you. We can shift over to Aristotle here and give him a nice 360 spin. And then if I want to adjust back, I just change my mode to one, and now it's back to a tilt follow, and I now have all of my movement of my gimbal once again. A lot of really handy stuff there so that you can define the gimbal settings that you need to set it up the way you want. Um, now, I mean, that really concludes everything I had for the build portion. Let's see if you guys had any questions that popped up so I can address some of those. And uh, yeah. Just wanted to review all the bits that you're using, and that's it. Sure. Uh, let's go over, uh, once again, what we're using. I'll move this over so you guys can get a good look at it. So this here, all together, is what I call the Slim Down Music Video Package. And that goes with the Panasonic Lumix GH5 paired with our Leica DG Vario 12 to 60 millimeter f2.8 lens. We're mounting all of that onto our Ronin S here that then is going to run focus control to this follow focus wheel right down here. And we're running a wireless video signal with our Teradek Bolt Ace here to our wireless monitor right over here that our director can run around with up to 500 feet away. Really fun, really easy to do setup video or build that you can do in less than an hour if you need to. So if you guys have any questions or anything that comes up, comment below. We can address them down the line or just give us a call or email us. Uh, as always, guys, if you're looking to stream yourselves, we rent that equipment and can help with the setup. Visit perfectcircle.pro and we can pair you up not only with gear but with an operator as well to conduct the stream for you to make sure that it all goes smooth and the way you need it to. If you guys have anything that you want to see down the line, whether it be tomorrow, next week, or whenever, comment down below and we'll do the builds that you guys want to take a look at or highlight a particular piece of gear that you're interested in. If you guys have any questions or anything, just give, give us a call or visit magrents.com and I'll plan to see you guys tomorrow.